thank you everybody for joining us for our eighth and final week of our Healthy Hearty Heifers series. This week, we are gonna be talking about pre-calving comfort and facilities, um, just to kind of round it all off and lead us right up into that calving period. So we have uh, Dr. Katie Proudfoot from University of PEI. She is an associate professor and the director of the Sir James Dunn Animal Welfare Center at the University of PEI in Canada. So before we get started, just as a reminder, um, this is week eight. So we have seven other episodes that have now been posted to YouTube. And um, next week, this episode will also be posted to YouTube. So please make sure to go on to YouTube and check those out. Oh, and Betsy just posted the link to the recordings in the chat. Also, as a reminder, we wanna say thank you to our sponsors for making it possible for us to offer this program for free for free for participants. Uh, so thank you to Diamond V, Zimpro, Pool and Green, and Arm and Hammer. So uh, we will get started. And again, if you guys have any questions, you can feel free to put them in the Q&A box and we will get to them um, at the end once Katie is done presenting. So Katie, I'm gonna stop sharing and then you can start sharing. All right, how does that look? Perfect. Awesome. Okay, well, thank you for the invitation. Um, this is the first talk I've ever given that is focused on heifers. And I'm very excited about that because I think that we don't pay enough attention to heifers, particularly during the transition period. So what I've done is I've tried to, I've scoured the literature and tried to put together some research from my own lab, but also from some of my colleagues that have measured uh, some comfort and sort of facility impacts on heifers throughout the transition period with a focus mainly on the pre-calving period just because that's where a majority of the research is. So what I'll start with is something that you all already know, which is what happens to heifers and other cows around transition and why it's such a, a sort of tumultuous period for our dairy animals. And probably a, one of the main reasons why so many animals get sick after calving. There's a number of stressors that happen right around transition. So one of them that uh, we see both pre-calving and post-calving is overcrowding or competition for resources. Uh, this is something that I often look into other species in the human literature and the laboratory animal literature just to see sort of how, how they're looking at things like stressors, particularly in pregnant people and animals. And crowding is one of the key stressors. They actually use crowding as a method to stress animals out. So we know that's really stressful uh, for a, a majority of mammals, actually, as well as regrouping or what other sort of scientists would call uh, social instability. This is something that, again, any social species, if you remix them or move them into a novel social environment, this can be quite stressful. Of course, there's the sort of inevitable things that happen at transition, like pain associated with labor. And you can't really explain that to a heifer. You can't say, so what's happening right now is you're about to have a baby and they have absolutely no idea what's happening to them. And they undergo a lot of pain associated with just giving birth, especially if they experience a dystocia. Uh, they're separated from their calf, which we know is stressful regardless of when you do it. For heifers, kind of a, a, an additional stressor is a novel environment. Now they have to go into a milking parlor or an AMS, an automatic milking system that they've never seen before. There's lots of new noises, lots of new smells, lots of new things that again can be stressful. And there's a lot more human interaction. So for heifers often, you know, before they calf, they're out in the back 40 or they're in an environment where they don't have as much interactions with people. As soon as they calf, they're going to the parlor two or three times a day, or there's much more interaction with humans, which depending on what the interaction looks like can be stressful. So I think a really key thing and, and a way to look at this and all of these things that are happening is that they're both uncontrollable and unpredictable for the animal. And if you look at the definition of stress, it's that things that are uncontrollable and unpredictable in, in our lives or in the lives of animals. 
So some of these things are inevitably uncontrollable, right? So we can't really give heifers control over whether they experience pain during labor unless we give them pain control. Um, but some of these other things, I think we as humans, as caretakers, we can help mitigate some of the stress just by giving animals a little bit more control of their environment or understanding what causes stress and then um, using that knowledge to help mitigate these stressors. So that's really what we're gonna focus on for the rest of this talk. I do also uh, wanted to start with what makes heifers different? Um, and so we know, of course, that heifers are, are still growing. They're, they're not the same animal as, as an older cow uh, during the transition period. And Heather Neve, during her PhD, she's a PhD student at the University of British Columbia, uh, published a really nice paper a couple of years ago where all she did in the entire paper was just compare heifers to older cows during the transition period uh, and with a focus on behavior. So what did you find? Heifers had lower dry matter intake. That totally makes sense. They're smaller. They, they have less energy needs than older animals and they're still growing. Uh, they spend more time feeding. So it's a little bit interesting. In this particular case, they weren't overstocked. Uh, they eat a little bit slower. They visit the feed bunk more often, which is interesting. And we'll kind of talk about in a second what might be causing that. They explore the feed bunk more often, which is also uh, a, kind of interesting. So in this case, they had Incentech feed bins. And what they looked at is how many different bins each cow went to. And heifers tended to try more bins than older cows. Uh, in terms of lying time, they lay down more frequently. So they get up and down more often, particularly as calving approaches. That's something that we really commonly see is these lying bouts go up um, as they start experiencing discomfort due to contractions and labor. Whoops. Uh, they have shorter periods of lying time. So in, over the course of the day, they have the same amount of lying time, but they just do it in shorter bouts throughout the day. And then kind of a key thing is that what she found is they, they were more what they called replaced at the feed bunk, or you can refer to it also as displacements at the feed bunk. And I'll show a video of what that looks like if that's not a term that you're familiar with. Uh, but this is essentially where another cow kicks them out of the feed bunk. And so heifers were more likely to be the replacer as opposed to the, uh, the, the cow doing the displacements, which might be a reason why they're visiting the feed bunk more often as they're going in, they're getting pushed out and they're coming back in. So here's a video of, of what a, a displacement or a replacement uh, looks like. Um, so I want you to focus here on cow eight. And cow two, I don't actually know if this is a heifer, but let's pretend she is because she is quite small compared to the other animals. Um, but I want you to watch these two here. All right, so cow eight physically used her body and her head to push out cow two uh, from the feed bunk. And it's a displacement in the sense that she displaced the cow. It's a replacement in the sense that she essentially now is sitting in the same spot as that, as that we'll, we'll call heifer. I don't know if it's a heifer or a cow, but we'll call it a heifer. Um, so then this heifer, again, is gonna have a harder time getting back in here. So this is one of the things that we measure when we measure sort of the impacts of, of different management strategies like regrouping and overstocking and how it affects the cows uh, from a behavior perspective. All right, so for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna go through what I consider kind of the, the three most important principles or, or three important principles, sorry, four important principles for transition heifer management. And I don't think any of this will be terribly surprising for you because we do talk about this in, in terms of cows and heifers in general, but we'll try to focus more on the impacts of, of particularly heifers. So the first is to provide heifers with space and comfort before, during, and after calving. And space and comfort means, or comfort can mean lots of different things. So we'll talk about, I'll, I'll use one example, but we'll talk about how uh, different ways of looking at comfort. Um, the second is giving heifers choice and the opportunity to express some of their natural behaviors. This gets back to that idea of uh, stressors being uncontrollable. If we can try to allow heifers to have some choice in their environment, that's gonna reduce their stress and separate stressors so they don't accumulate. So all those things in, in, during the transition period tend to happen all at once. 
Uh, and there is ways that we can kind of separate these out and I'll give some examples of how we can do that. Uh, the last thing I'm gonna talk about is, is something that might be a little bit new, newish to the research world at least, and that's ensuring that heifers have positive experiences during transition. So we, there's a lot of negative things that happen during transition, but I think we can flip it and think about how can we add positivity or positive things to this environment, drawing on some of the other literature of other species and how they use things like positive reinforcement. So I'll give one example of that as well. So we'll start with space and comfort. And, and space is kind of the big one, right? So this is something that we talk about a lot in the transition period is to make sure that uh, cows and heifers have adequate feeding space <laughs> as well as lying space. So one example I'll give is uh, a study that was done, actually a couple of studies, but in particular it's a study that was done uh, by Dr. Julie Hussey, who you might be familiar with because she went to Cornell uh, during her PhD. And she looked at uh, different stocking densities during the dry period of cows and heifers and sort of analyzed them separately. So her two treatments were 200% versus 100%. So 100% cows had one stall to one cow and about 26 inches of bunk space. And in the 200% treatments, cows had, uh, there was two cows to one stall. So they did have to compete over access to the stall and 13 inches, which is less than half actually than what we recommend of bunk space per cow. And then she measured a number of physiological and behavioral indicators uh, of uh, health and welfare, and then looked at cows and heifers separately. And so I'll show the data for the heifers. Some of the cow results are similar, but they were, there were some differences between them. So ultimately what she found is that in the higher stocking density, heifers had higher NEFA, so non-esterified fatty acids, which we know uh, is something that could predict disease post-calving. Uh, fecal cortisol metabolites. So this is one way for us to measure stress physiologically using stress hormone cortisol. It's not the, the only measure of stress, but it is very useful for us. And, and in this case, it, it sort of tells the story of uh, the stocking, overstocking is causing potentially stress in the heifers and glucose. It took longer for heifers in the overstock group to approach the feed bunk compared to understocked, and they spent less time eating, probably because uh, they were eating faster, um, and they maybe took less time or took longer to approach the feed bunk just because there are so many other cows. If you imagine that video that I showed, so many other cows eating at once that they were standing behind waiting to get access to eat, and then they had higher displacements as well in the overstocked versus the understocked groups. So this was quite an extreme treatment. Uh, there's been more work that I've looked at sort of less extreme differences in stocking density, but I think it nicely illustrates how when you do overcrowd and even for a short period of time, the study was only done over a couple of weeks, um, it can lead to these physiological and behavioral issues in heifers. In terms of comfort, I'm really going to focus mostly on the, the stall or sort of the housing environment. Um, comfort can also mean thermal comfort. So that is something that's been quite well researched as well, particularly uh, from the group down in Florida. Uh, they've looked at the impacts of heat stress and heat stress mitigation of cows and heifers during the transition period and found extremely profound effects actually, well, especially in Florida where it gets very hot and humid. Um, but pretty profound effects on not only the cows, but their calves post-calving. Um, so things are happening in utero uh, that actually impact the calf's ability to stay healthy after birth. So heat stress is something we certainly want to avoid and something to, to really pay attention to. If you're thinking of mitigating heat in your high lactating pens, you must also be doing it in your pre-calving pens and I would say in your fresh pens as well and your maternity pens. Most of my research is with maternity pens. So that's something that I, I feel really strongly about is making sure that those, those spaces are extremely comfortable. In terms of the uh, lying environment, uh, I think these pictures kind of help illustrate what, what 
to do and what not to do, especially if you're if you have a freestall environment. Uh, but deep bedded sand or uh, dried manure solids, uh, wide stalls, lots of lunge space. Again, there's been decades of research looking at all these different factors that influence cow comfort. And one of the things we, we measure, how we measure cow comfort is, is lying time. So you, when you walk into your pre-calving pen, you wanna see your cows lying down. You don't wanna see them perching like this. Uh, or, or standing next to the stall. You wanna see them lying down in the stall and, and your heifers as well. Uh, so in the, this picture, I think nicely illustrates what not to do in your pre-calving pen, which is mattresses without a lot of bedding. You can see this cow has a hawk lesion. Um, here, there's no lunge space because this board is here. It also looks like the neck rail is sort of in a, in a, in a, a too forward of a position. Uh, so these cows are perching and they're telling you that this is not a comfortable environment and they don't want to lay down. So some of the research, again, this could be a whole 60 minute presentation, but uh, deep bedding, something I highly recommend in the pre-calving period if you can do it. If you have mattresses, then the more bedding you can put and the more often you can bed, the better to make sure that that bedding stays on top. You don't want the bedding to just move off of the mattress and have only the mattress there. Um, it improves lying time, reduces hawk lesions. This is for heifers and cows alike, but it's something that uh, for sure you wanna look for in your heifers. Um, typically the heifers are smaller, so the, the stalls, they should be fitted well for the stalls. Uh, but again, looking at stall width, neck rail position, lunge space, all of these things can affect lying time behavior. Um, and then there's some really interesting work out of UBC looking at uh, the effect of wet bedding on lying time and cows don't like wet bedding. So if you can uh, avoid that by cleaning as often as possible, uh, but also, for example, if you're using dry manure solids, try to make sure that, that the bedding dry matter is, um, is high, as high as can be. I think the recommendations are at least 70% dry matter. So some kind of quick recommendations, actually I'm stealing these recommendations from the Wisconsin Blueprint because if I've ever asked about cow comfort, always refer to the Dairyland Initiative, which was um, spearheaded by Dr. Nigel Cook and Ken Nordland at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, if you have questions about transition cow facilities and housing, uh, go to their website and you can find all this information and it's all based on science. So their recommendations, which I would, I would certainly agree with, is 30 inches of bunk space at least 21 days before and after calving, deep loose bedded free stalls sized to accommodate the cows, or it doesn't have to be free stalls. I mean, you could also have uh, bedded packs, but bedded packs, again, the key here is dryness. So making sure you're adding bedding at least every couple of days and cleaning out the whole pack every couple of weeks. And then in terms of space, at least one lying stall per cow or what they recommend is at least hundred square feet per cow. I added this plus because I actually recommend more than that. And you'll see why in the next, in my next um, principle, uh, especially around calving time, because we know that's the time when the, the more space you can give the better if you're talking about bedded packs. All right, so switching gears now to choice and natural behavior. Uh, this has been a big focus of my research. And so I'm showing you a beautiful picture of a uh, pasture in Tennessee in the middle of the summer, um, because this is one of the ways that we use to understand what are useful kind of facility designs in our indoor settings is to let cows go outside and show us what they would do in a natural setting. We can learn from that natural behavior and try to then bring it indoors. So in this particular study, this was done with the University of Tennessee and the Minor Institute as well, Dr. Heather Dan at the Minor Institute and Peter Crozell, University of Tennessee, uh, where we essentially let cows calve on pasture. We were really interested in calving behavior and the location of a calving site. So this is something that I focused a lot of my PhD uh, research on. And then this was when I was a faculty member at Ohio State. So we asked where cows would choose to calve if given access to a small pasture or a barn. So they had access to indoors as well. And what factors impact their calving location? So here's what the barn looked like. It was a bedded pack with straw uh, and they had their TMR delivered. 
um, here through their headlocks. And then the doorway to the pasture was over here on this side. So they, oh, they had free access to that at all times. Oops. This was the open pasture. So looking out of the barn, essentially this is what you saw. So there's a wide open pasture. And then in the very back, we had uh, this area here where there was tall grass, there was trees we kept around. We didn't let them mow back here. So we let the, the grass grow a little bit. And so we asked the cows where they chose to calve essentially. And we had cameras all over. This is a aerial view of the pasture. Uh, it was about five acres. And here you can see the barn. And so th these weren't physically uh, separated, but this is sort of how we calculated where cows chose to calve as we look, looked at these different areas of the pasture. This one here, number nine, was the area with the trees and the tall grass. So where did cows calve? What do you think about that for a second? Let's see if, let's see if you guessed right. So we had about half, uh, or not half, about third calve in the barn about third calf out here, and then the rest calf through the rest of this pasture. So we certainly saw a preference for either inside or this area of natural forage. And that actually was, well, was what we sort of expected. Uh, <laughs> we certainly expected some cows to calve out in the natural forage area because if you look at other ungulates or beef cows, if any of you have ever been on a cow-calf operation um, and you ask them where the cow shoots to calve, they, leave the herd and they find a secluded place to give birth. Um, moose do the same thing, some wild ungulates do the same thing. So we wanted to see if dairy cows did the same thing. And so some of them calved in this area of natural forage and then some of them calved in the barn. Now we found a parity effect. So heifers and cows behaved differently. Heifers chose the area of natural forage, whereas cows chose the barn. And this was really interesting to us. We can't fully explain it, but one reason could be that cows had previous experience calving in a barn um, or just more experience in a barn in general, whereas heifers uh, were going more with their natural instincts, which was to go into the area of natural forage. It could also be social status, maybe in the barn, um, they got, again, displaced or there's some sort of, they were picked on a little bit and that's why they went as far away as possible to give birth. But that was really interesting um, for us to learn, especially this idea that heifers in particular really sought uh, a hidden place to give birth. So we've done a number of studies looking at how we can kind of practically do this indoors. Uh, this is one example. This was one that we actually did at the Minor Institute in Jay-Z with Dr. Heather Dan. Um, and she, I'm gonna give her all the credit for thinking of this brilliant idea. Um, but we were trying to think of a way in a group bedded pack barn um, how to give cows some way of hiding if they wanted to. And so she had this brilliant idea of uh, what was called a Jersey road barrier. So they use these in construction on the side of the road um, and they're hollow in plastic. And so they're about a hundred pounds empty. So you can, with two people, move it around pretty easily and you fill it with water and it's indestructible by cows. Um, my PhD student at the time, who's now uh, an assistant professor, um, in River Falls, Wisconsin, Dr. Kate Krutzinger. Uh, she also added sort of a little elevated area here too, because she wanted this to be high enough where the cows can't see over when they're laying down, but when they stand up, they can see over and still be vigilant over their environment. So she, not, she looked at a number of things and she looked at cows and heifers. We didn't find any parity differences, interestingly, but there are some interesting um, conclusions from the study that I did wanna share. And actually what we did was a bit more complicated too. It was a, what, what was called a two by two factorial arrangement of treatment. So we had two things we were looking at. One was this hide or what we called the barrier. The other was space. So this picture here on the top left is 100 square feet of space per cow of, of lying space. So this didn't count the alley, this was just the lying space. And then it's a bit hard to see here, but uh, we essentially doubled that. So then in another treatment, we gave them 200 square feet. Here was our barrier with 100 square feet. And here was our barrier with 200 square feet. And Kate looked at a number of different um, outcomes, physiological outcomes and behavioral outcomes. Um, and so I'll go over a couple of them with you. The first, which was obviously our most uh, important question is, did they actually use the barrier to give birth? And so this shows sort of an aerial view 
of these four different pens. So we had the 100 square feet with a, with a, a, a barrier or a blind, actually, as she called it, 200 square feet with the blind, and then without the blind. And so here, the next slide I'll show you is a sort of a heat map of where the, the cows and the heifers combined chose to calve. And so you can see there's uh, quite an attraction, especially when the, when the hide was in the pen, and especially actually in the, in the larger pen um, to calving. Essentially, they, they uh, put themselves up against the side of the barrier. And they clearly avoided some places too. So when you're thinking of square footage, uh, uh, especially around calving, you have to think about things like no cows calve next to these doors, uh, very few cows calve next to the water bin, which was here. Uh, so there are some things that are very unattractive to cows um, in, in bedded pack barns, at least. Uh, some of the take home message. So we found no really major effects on physiological biomarkers, um, but we did find some, some interesting behavioral differences where cows and heifers with the most space when they calved, they separated themselves. So she used a grid and she actually looked at, did they move away from the group? And she found that they did if they had that space. Uh, I think really interestingly too, the cows and the heifers in the pen with the blind and the most space had the shortest labor, which could mean that they're experiencing less disturbance and less stress during that time period, which allowed them to calve more naturally. All right, so recommendations for this one um, is to find a way to at least provide some sort of seclusion for cows at calving. This is a picture from one of the studies I did in my PhD uh, where we had individual calving pens and we just put up a little blind uh, and 80% of the cows calved on this side of the pen. This is a picture from Dr. Ken Nordland from a farm in Wisconsin where they put up a large um, curtain in between their calving pens here and the rest of the barn because they found there's a lot of noise and activity here with the, um, the feed truck and stuff going through. So this helped make it a more secluded environment. This is a picture from a farm in Ohio where their uh, maternity pens are right next to the milking parlor, which is very common. We like to put our maternity pens where we can see the cows all the time, but cows don't like that. They like the opposite. So they put up a corrugated metal here wall in between the parlor um, and the maternity area, which gave them a little bit more seclusion. So some recommendations here, providing heifers with the opportunity to hide at calving, they have the strongest motivation to at least find that natural hide. Um, use cameras and maternity pens. So this will help you, you don't need to go in all the time and check on the cows in person, because that can disturb them. So try to avoid handling them as much as possible. Obviously, if they are experiencing dystocia, you need to, but use, use other methods like cameras to help you do that without um, disturbing them. All right. I'm on number three, uh, and I will try to talk quickly. So separating stressors. Uh, the example I'm going to use here is regrouping, because this is something that we know is a big stressor for cows. This was a study done back in 2008 by um, folks at University of British Columbia, where they looked at feed bunk displacements on the day relative to regrouping uh, for cows and heifers and found that regardless of whether you're a cow or a heifer, you get regrouped and you're the reactor. You're the one getting pushed out of the feed bunk. Um, now imagine this for heifers and it's probably even worse because we know that even in like an understocked environment, they're the most pushed out. And it took a few days for them to come back to normal. There's also uh, been some studies looking at regrouping prepartum and it results in 9% lower feed intake and less rumination time. Um, and in lactating cows, it also re reduces milk production. Uh, so there has been some studies that have looked at how do we, if we're gonna, we have to regroup or unless you have an all in all out system, we have to regroup. How do we separate regrouping from other stressors? So one study I did with um, Dr. Margit Jensen in um, uh, Denmark is we moved cows and heifers uh, into smaller groups, six versus 24 animals, and that helped reduce some of those feed bunk displacements. So smaller groups post calving could be helpful if you have a fresh pen. Um, another study looked at moving cows and heifers into uh, understocked pens. So I think this is a key one, is if you're going to regroup, regroup with lots of space. Uh, and they found that this reduced agonistic behavior, so these displacements and increased lying time. So separate your regrouping from overstocking um, and, and larger groups, although this isn't very large, but still. 
Uh, this was a really interesting study that was done through, uh, again, Dr. Julie Hussey's group, where she looked at moving heifers either by themselves or with a partner. And she found that moving them with a partner decreased fecal cortisol metabolites, uh, be, probably because there's less stress when they have that familiar partner with them. There's also a recent study by Hannah Erickson, again, out of UBC, where she found that when you moved heifers um, into an overstocked pen of unfamiliar cows, they had less of those agonistic behaviors or displacements when they're moved into a, an understocked pen of familiar cows. So again, trying to separate the regrouping stress from these other stressors. So some recommendations here. Uh, regroup as little as possible. So I recommend no more than one time a week. Regroup. Um, instead of moving individual animals, you move them as a group. Try all in all out groupings. If you have questions about what that is, uh, we can talk about that if you want to totally avoid regrouping. Uh, and then again, regroup as pairs or small groups that can help mitigate the stress and regroup into understocked pens. This is a really key one, and I get asked this question all the time. Avoid introducing heifers to cows right after calving. So if you have a pre-fresh heifer pen, don't then move them into a, a mixed older cow heifer pen post-calving. If you have pre-fresh heifer, keep a post-fresh heifer pen or mix them way before calving to again, to help separate that from the stressors of calving. Okay, last thing I'm gonna talk about is positive experiences. And so first thing I wanna do is show this video because I think it's something that we will all um, have some familiarity with if anyone has ever tried to move a heifer before. <laughs> so this heifer is a little bit younger than, than our, our pre-calving heifers. Um, this was a study done by Dr. Julia Lom at the University of British Columbia. And so this heifer clearly doesn't wanna go where they want her to go. We can imagine this getting a heifer into the milking parlor for the first time or essentially getting a heifer anywhere that they don't wanna go. They're gonna kick you, they're gonna do whatever they can, back up against you um, to make it so they don't have to do it. So how do we change that? How do we change it so it's not so scary for heifers? And so what Julia did in her study is uh, she trained heifers with positive reinforcement, which is a learning uh, technique, using food, so a food reward, to stand for a subcutaneous injection. Um, they sent, I'll show you a video of this, but heifers using this sort of positive reinforcement, they learn to accept the rejection without restraint. So here they show it, it looks like a headlock, but it's actually not locked. Um, so they would put their head in and they would take an injection without causing any problems. And it reduced what's called avoidance behavior. So of them trying to avoid human contact. So let me illustrate this with a video. This was a video that Julia sent me. Here you can see this is post-training. They're getting their food reward. That's an injection. So they're giving her a shot right now. And she had barely any response. Some of the heifers had, had more responses than that. Um, but this one I like, this is the heifer I showed you at the beginning. She's maybe a little too excited even, but she's volunteering herself now to get her injection after the training. <laughs> And here's that same heifer getting her food reward and preparing herself for this painful procedure. So we, we can kind of flip the script here. Oops. Um, in terms of, of things like introducing heifers to novel environments. Uh, there's been some research recently actually with AMS training heifers pre-calving to go into AMS, learn they get their grain reward, um, and then post-calving that will increase milking frequency and reduce fetching because they've learned and they've learned this is a nice place. I actually like going to this place. Uh, there was a study that looked at introducing heifers to the milking parlor before calving and it increased early milk production and reduced utter edema. Uh, there's also been tons of research looking at how negative handling, so us trying to push, us hitting, us shouting at them to get them in the parlor can have a long-term effect. It can make it so they're stressed, they don't let down their milk. Um, and so all these things sort of add up when they come into the parlor. So recommendations here, try to make the heifer's first experience with the parlor or AMS a positive one. When you can use food rewards uh, and avoid negative handling. So I'll wrap up, I think just as a, a last conclusion, again, to think about all these things that we talked about at the beginning being stressors and how some of these things we can control. 
We can make our human interactions more positive. We can introduce them to the parlor or AMS earlier, try to make that more of a positive experience. Uh, we can regroup into less stressful pins or regroup as, as pairs or as small groups, and we can reduce overcrowding. Some of these things we, can, we have less control of, um, but at least we can mitigate some of the things that happen right at transition. So with that, I will wrap up and take any questions that you have. Thank you, Katie, that was great. So much to think about and consider for pre-calving and I mean, heifers and cows both. Um, so if anyone has any questions, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A box now. And um, while we wait for questions, Lindsay or Betsy, do you have any that you'd like to ask? Uh, yeah, I'll ask. Um, are you doing any more work, Katie, with the calving blinds? Like, where's what are your next steps there? So, yes, yes and no. Um, can you talk about it? <laughs> yeah, I can. So, in our last in our last study or study we did, uh, we did a study in New Zealand, and in that one we had cows out in these big pads, and there are these hides that we created for them, and we <laughs> we found that the cows didn't really use the hides to calve, but then we looked at what happened after calving. And about 80% of the calves went into the hides. So the calves are motivated to hide after calving, which makes sense because in nature, calves will be hidden for the first few days of life uh, before they're introduced to the rest of the herd. So in the study we're doing now in collaboration with the University of Dalhousie is where we have calf hides. So we've made little, actually out of um, hog panels, and we've made little hides in, the, in a post-calving pen uh, for calves to use. And I have a master's student who's looking at um, not only are they using them, but also comparing with and without a hide if there's differences in some indicators of stress. Awesome. Cool. So kind of building on that, Katie, do you think that there's an opportunity to use isolation, whether that be like a blind or that curtain in that one picture that you showed kind of separating them off from the rest of the barn? in any other times of life, like if they're experiencing illness or like in a hospital pen or other stressful periods? Yes, excellent question. Uh, yeah, so um, one of my studies that I did in my PhD, we looked at that hide that I showed uh, in Denmark, the, the uh, plywood hide. We use that for calving. And then after calving, we kept the cow in the pen for the first three days. and. I noticed I was walking through the barn and I noticed this one cow and she post calving, she was just always in the hide. And so I talked to the vet and she had a pretty severe metritis. She had an RP. Um, and so she was quite clinically ill. And so we actually, from that, we decided to do sort of a follow-up study and we looked at uh, the cows that were sick and were not sick uh, in that three day period, a really short period after calving. Uh, to see if there was differences in their use of the hide. And there was, um, uh, at least for the cows that had a, a fever. That's how we sort of defined it, is they had to have some sort of clinical sign. So it could have been mastitis, metritis, or pneumonia, and a fever. And, and so they did, they were attracted to the hide. And that also makes sense because social isolation is something that uh, sick animals in general, like humans too, we don't, if we're, if we're sick, we like to go down uh, and, and watch. Netflix by ourselves and not go out and party with our friends. Uh, so it is a sickness behavior that is useful for a number of reasons that you might see. So I would recommend having hospital pens with similar sort of designs. The only thing I, I would steer clear of of making it um, so it's completely isolated. I think you still need to give choice because there's going to be cows that don't don't want that social isolation. And it depends on the disease. There was a study that my colleagues in Denmark did. Um, with, which was a follow-up to our study where they looked at lame cows with a hide and the lame cows actually didn't use the hide, maybe because they weren't having a, a, a febrile response, which might be why it could be one of the differences. We don't know for sure. So some animals will be attracted to hide, some, some won't. And now I'll stop talking in a second, but I also, my master's student right now, uh, Hannah Spitzer, she's writing a, a review paper on the use of hides in, in animals and different species. And for some species, hides like mink, we put, we put hides in mink cages uh, at all time periods of their life because they like it, they, need, they use it, 
is something that's important to them. Um, I think it's something we can study more in cows to see there might be other times in their lives where they, they just want the ability to get away from the noise and activity of the barn. And often we don't give them that opportunity. So I think that would be kind of cool future research. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so I think we're, we're good to wrap up. I just want to take a moment to thank our sponsors once again. Diamond V, Zimpro, Cooling Grain, and Arm and & Hammer. Without their support, this program wouldn't be available at no cost to participants, so we're thankful for them. And we're also very thankful for you, Katie, um, for joining us for this last session. It was a great way to wrap up the series, and it provided a lot of really helpful and, and informative insights into how we can better manage those heifers pre-calving. So thank you again for joining us, and thank you to everyone for uh, joining the series, if this was your first session or if you've joined all eight, we really appreciate it.